Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of our podcast, um, Better Business, Better Life with Jenny Clift. And today, really pleased to welcome Julia Ewart. So Julia, I know through EO, Entrepreneurs Organisation in Perth. Um, I've done a l- number of training sessions there through EO and met Julia a number of times and really invited her on today because I'm fascinated with what she does, which is all around sales and negotiation. Uh, so welcome, Julia. Great to have you here. Thanks, Jenny. Great to be here with you today. Great. So, Julia, let I'll throw it to you. Please do a better intro than my very uh, brief one there. Tell us about you and how you got to be in your business. Sure, Jenny. So, um, so my company is named the same as me, so that's really easy to remember. So, my company is called Julia Hewitt, and essentially, um, myself and my team, um, I am a sales strategist and a professional negotiator. So we get hired by service-based organisations to teach a repeatable, customizable sales process. Uh, we are pretty much one-trick ponies and happy to be that way. We just do the same thing over and over again. Uh, and we customise a sales process to every organisation we work with, Jenny, and that becomes the revenue machine of the company. Nice. I like it. I like the uh, the one-trick pony, you know, do what you do well and stick to that. Uh, stick to your knitting, as I, uh, as I often remind people, and try to be everything to yes. everybody. So, so we it did always start, start out doing that. I did start up doing everything to everyone, but uh, yes, that doesn't work out very well. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, and uh, and as entrepreneurs, we often get very caught up in uh, shiny objects and those sort of things. But um, but really, you know, the key to I think successful business in uh, particularly small team as you have is around you know knowing what you do well and stick to that. So. So when we start our podcast, we always start with the same th- uh, couple of questions. So share with us a personal and a professional win over the last, up to a year, uh, but up to you, over to you. Yeah, I think the um, the professional win would have to be, um, I had two cool things happen this year. I got a contract with LinkedIn uh, to produce some video content for their LinkedIn learning library. Uh, I'm the uh, first and only Australian uh, in the LinkedIn library uh, of for sales and negotiations. That's cool. Uh, and hot off the press, Jenny, just last week I signed a book deal. So I had a major oh, publisher no. approach me for a uh, to write a book on my signature process. So that would definitely, I can't think I can, I, I don't think I could top that. They're probably the, the biggest things that come to my mind professionally. Congratulations. And then personally, I would suggest um, we've had a great year. Uh, I have two young kids and I have a husband who's semi-retired, which has been engineered that way. Uh, We've had a great year where I've been able to work full time and I love what I do. And he works uh, very part time. And personally, that has made a huge amount of difference for our family. Uh, It allows me to hang out with the kids. It allows me to... um, uh also work because my work just brings me joy and it allows my husband to be home most of the time so personally um you know our family's a bit different that way but that works for us and uh yeah we we love it and doesn't that fit well with the name of our of our podcast around better business better life and i I love that you've engineered that to to suit your family you know um, my husband and I've worked together for 27 years and we get so many comments you know couldn't work with my partner and my view is always well I can't imagine building a business with anybody else um, and we're doing it for our family and for you you know do what works and, and you know the we're a bit different fantastic uh, in one of uh, you know often our one of our um, learning days is you know um, be different not be better um, now, tell me about this LinkedIn deal. How did that happen? I didn't even know that they had a learning library. Oh, Jenny, you're missing out on a whole world of expertise. It's fascinating. So the Link- LinkedIn had just recently turned over actual number, 1 billion users. So um, that is their actual number. And so they have a LinkedIn learning library. So they have um, experts that they have procured from around the globe. There's uh, out of their 1 billion users that they, they're LinkedIn instructors. They have about 1100 of which I'm now one of. And uh, these people are all around the world and they uh, they commission you to produce some very specific learning content for their content for their library. So it was a 14 month process from contract signing 
to um, to uh, to release uh, of the program, and um, it's fascinating. So before the pandemic, they would have flown me to their studio in South Carolina to do all the filming, uh, which would have been cool. But instead, uh, they had sent me all the equipment remotely to to uh, to uh, to record from home, and it was fascinating because in this kit that turned up, there was a truckload of equipment. There was a laptop already configured to all the equipment. I had a production team, so I had a, a staging, lighting, um, a, a, a person who scouted location, uh, a sound technician, um, and we worked together to record the course. So it's, I learned so much. It was fascinating to be a part of. And it's a, it's a, it's a great contract. Um, it's nice to be recognised for having content that's valuable for other people. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to be in their uh, – I guess, in their their cohort of um, instructors. Nice. And do they they approach you? Is this something that, you know, you kind of found and and went after? How did it work? Yeah, interestingly, um, it's a bit of the irony of what I do. So part of the one trick that we do about sales process, Jenny, is we help our clients get in front of decision makers and then we help them to pitch or explain what they do in a way that makes people sit up and, and pay attention. So, uh, and then it shifts you from being a nice to have to a need. So I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy uh, who introduced me into someone at LinkedIn. And then I just use my own process to get to the right person and explain how I can help in a way that made them um, sit up and pay attention. Nice. Uh, practice what you preach. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I hope you're leveraging off that uh, to say, you know, this is what can happen. I'm sure you are. Um, Okay, so let's talk yes, so, more um, about. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. Go. Uh, let's talk more about your family. Now you've mentioned that your, um, you know, you're a little bit different in the way that your, um, I guess, family dynamic is around. That you know, you're the one working full time. Um, your husband's part time. How did that come about? Was that something that had sort of always been the plan, or was it just did it evolve? So I love what I do. I've always loved what I've done. Um, my husband is a geologist um, and um, where he works, you know, we're in the mining sector, essentially. Or he's in the mining sector here in Western Australia, uh, where, you know, most of, the, most of the state runs on mining or oil and gas. And so he's what they call a FIFO worker. FIFO is fly in, fly out. So he flies to work. And um, he's been a geologist for, that's, he's been, that's been his entire career. And in the summer months where he's working, it get it can get up to 56 degrees. Uh, and he's out there kicking dirt, um, looking for iron ore um, with the drilling teams. And you know what? It's not safe. That's the short version. And we've got a young family. Who really wants to work in 54 degree heat or 56 degree heat? Anyone? <laughs> so, so after a couple of summers of that, I went, you know what? That's not on. It's not great. And... Um, and so he doesn't um, love doing that because, as I said, who would love to work in that heat? And I love what I do. And my business was starting to get some good traction, uh, Jenny. So uh, he wanted to be home less. Uh, he wanted to be home more and I wanted to work more. Mm-hmm. And so when I was starting to get some traction um, and i would narrowed down, you know, you touched on it earlier, being everything to everyone doesn't work. The second I started to niche down and do one thing, it changed, supercharged what I was doing. So uh, we became specialists instead of generalists. Uh, it increased demand for our services, which changed a whole lot around our company. It allowed me to put t- a team on and, um, and to start to work smarter. So I put a plan in place with my husband and we both were on the same page. I wanted to work more. He wanted to work less. We, we don't have any family here and we have young kids. So we knew that one of us had to do all the lunch boxing and uniform hemming and grocery runs and, and um, you know, all those sorts of things and, you know, be present at the school. And um, and so he wanted to, to do more of that. So I, we put some plans in place financially and worked out how long would it physically take or actually take for me to get there. And I thought I could do it by the year 2025. I could semi-retire him. Um, so back then when we were planning it, that was in the year 2020, I thought it would take me five years but I didn't, I, I did it in 18 months. Wow. So, okay. uh, so he has been home for the last few years and everyone got what they wanted. I got to work more and he got to work less and the kids love it. 
Well, kids love it. Nice. And it's, I, I remember when early on in our business, our youngest son, Sam, was at kindergarten. So he was four. And once a term, each of the parents was expected to go in and, and um, you know, help out at the kindergarten, you know, fruit duty, I think we used to call it. And um, Nick was driving Sam to kindergarten one day and said, oh, you know, um, I'll have to make sure that I put my name down this this uh, this term for, uh, for fruit duty. And Sam's comment was, well, Dad, it's a bit embarrassing that you come to kindergarten because no other dads do. You're the only one. And, and Nick said, well, why is it embarrassing? He said, because you don't have a real job. So Sam's impression at the age of four, because only mums came to kindergarten, that, you know, Nick was able to come because he didn't have a real job to go to every day where, I guess, you know, in a four-year-old's mind, you know, you you, you have a job, you go to work every day. Um, and it was interesting then to sort of try and have a conversation with a four-year-old about, well, actually, it's not about that I don't have a real job. It's actually that we've created a life where we can go and do these things. And it's, yeah. as you said, it's unusual. Um, but I love that you, well, firstly, that you did it in 18 months where you thought it was five years. Um, one thing I'm really intrigued about is I know what you do is so specialised. You know, you've got that that program, um, all of the training that you've had in, in sales and negotiating what does your team look like? How do you replicate what you do? Um, what does your team do? Um, you know, if you're bringing somebody into that team, what's the, the time frame for them to really sort of be able to even start to do what you do? Yeah, so I have a small team, Jenny. Um, I have, I've got a, now uh, my team are consultants. Uh, I don't have any full-time or permanent team members. I have an assistant uh, and she is with me um, probably about 15 hours a week and she manages my calendar and all my e emails and my inbox, which is great because that's out of control. <laughs> so, um, and that definitely saves me hour for hour. So prior to her, and that was scary, you know, as you would know, if you remember back in your, when you got, when you were um, early on in your business, uh, it's scary the first time you have to pay your own money for other people. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I did say to her when I started with her, I said, I want you to make me have one regret. I want you to make me regret that I didn't do this sooner. <laughs> so that worked okay. out pretty well. So I have an assistant who's with me um, um, and they're the tasks that she manages. I have a head of marketing. He's with me, I reckon, up to probably two to three days a week. He's been with me for a couple of years now and he drives the brand, the strategy, our strategic partnerships. Uh, and he helps me focus on what I'm touching all the tasks. Are they helping to move me towards or away from converting more of my ideal client? Um, that has been crucial in terms of even mindset for me and to make me become very um, precious with my time. So I have a head of marketing and assistant. Um, I have two facilitators who have uh, are going through the process at the moment, Jenny, to becoming upskilled in my signature program. And they're probably okay. about 60% there, which is great. So not 100%, but that's fine because they still free my time up, time up 60%. So that's remarkable compared to what I was doing. And uh, and just last week, I have um, I brought another person uh, in-house and they're going to be a CRM specialist because all our clients require CRM uh, um, assistance to help them leverage their CRM to convert more opportunities. And I've been outsourcing that work to a, a range of service providers for years. And I finally find the one. I found the one. So uh, I'm bringing her in-house and, uh, and she'll do that for our clients as well. So do you work with any, and I'll um, ask you about um, your ideal client in a sec, but with CRM, as you mentioned it, um, do you have a recommended one or are you happy to work with whoever, whatever they're, they're using? I get asked a lot, Julia, what do you use? We should use the same. It's not as simple as that. So in my company, I've changed CRMs four times and um, there's probably no point in me man man uh, mentioning which ones they were or where I am now because what I don't, what I never want people to take away is, oh, what do you use? Yeah. It doesn't matter what I use. Um, I just know that I use one and I'm, a, I, I'm masterful at it because this, I look at my CRM more than I look at my bank balance. And as a business owner, this is a lot. <laughs> so, um, but a CRM is an essential part of your business so that you can accurately, accurately forecast and predict the future. Without a CRM, you're doing sales by accident. 
So, um, so yes, Sarah absolutely, it's an essential. Yeah. yeah. Yes, essential. It's it's a tool, but an essential tool. But it's yeah, like I said, you know, which one it is probably not that relevant about more about actually having one. Um, yeah. So we're agnostic essentially, and we want to remain that way. So um, CRM specialists around most of them are getting kickbacks. Um, you know, and that can be quite lucrative and I've been offered that more times than I can count and um, it's really important to us that we're agnostic. So uh, we want to be able to put hand on heart and recommend to somebody the best CRM for them, not based on what we're getting uh, kicked back, but based right. on what is best for that company. So, yes, yeah, so we don't have loyalties. We have ones that we, we like better than others, um, but, yeah, we are completely agnostic. And I guess, you know, just thinking back through our business of, you know, that was sometimes a, a little bit off-putting for us if we were looking at a particular thing and they, they then dictated, you know, these are the tools that you have to use and we were not using them. That for me actually kind of went, oh, you know, it just makes it that much harder to change if we have to change all of these other things as well. Um, so we were, you know, we often sort of stayed in, we had an IT services business, as you know, and, um, you know, we were quite agnostic about, you know, the different um products that we looked after that sort of thing so it was more yeah. of a an industry niche that rather than a than a tools and that sort of thing so, yeah for sure no. so tell me about your um your program so uh firstly ideal client who comes to you what are they looking for when they uh find track you down um and what's what do you offer what you know um what's that um that one thing that you uh, do yeah. and do well. So I'll, I'll go back a step, Jenny, and I'll, I'll talk about um, essentially you talked about how to, you know, what clients come to me. If I go back probably 18 months in my business, even two years, I would be 100% outbound, which means everyone I converted, I had to find myself. Um, and that would be through networking. That would be through my work on LinkedIn. Um, I would have to look for opportunities. So I, I was always looking for needles and haystacks. And interestingly, I would, I used to have a coffee with anyone who had a pulse. Um, and I think that in, in business, if you're not talking to people and you're not meeting people, you're not doing business. So it's really important to ensure that you're well networked. So that paid off in spades because now it's the complete opposite. I am struggling for time. I get asked a lot for a, um, a, a coffee to pick, to, to pick my brain. And uh, I, I don't have a lot of time. I have some other ways I still serve people that ask me for that, but I, I don't have that luxury um, anymore. But I, as I said, I want to be clear, I still, have, um, I still pay that forward because a lot of people helped me when I got started. But if I look now, I'm probably around about 60-40. So 60% inbound, 40% outbound. Outbound is still really important because inbound is risky. So I have companies that brag and boast to me all the time, oh, we, Julia, we, we are 100% inbound. And all our leads come to us through our website or through referrals. And I always ask them, I say, great, can I ask you, when are the next 10 coming in and exactly how much will they be worth? So inbound is unpredictable and it's risky. So when you can balance that with an outbound approach, which is what we teach, it allows you to be more predictable in your company. And uh, as a result, being more predictable, it means that you have more sustainable revenue. So that's probably just a side point, but but necessary to mention because this is a topical conversation for businesses all the time. So our ideal client, um, Jenny, whether it's someone who comes into us or someone that we're approaching from an outbound perspective, uh, we work with B2B service or solution-based organisations who are, by choice, we work with non-traditional sales businesses. So we do not work with companies who have sales teams or BDMs um, we might have a client who has an, the odd BDM running around, um, but we work with the technicians and the, and the professional services. So our clients are engineers, they're IT companies, they are architects, they are consultants, um, they are manufacturing, they are industrial, mining services. Um, only 30% of our clients are probably based in Perth, the rest are everywhere else. Uh, and the characteristics that our clients have in common are they are non-traditional sales businesses. And it's funny, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. Lots of companies say to us, oh, Julia, you probably can't help us because we don't do sales. And I respond, I say, oh, you don't do revenue? And they go, oh, well, of course we do revenue. And I said, same thing. It's, that's yeah, the that's only right. word you can change for sales is revenue. It's the same. Um, so our clients don't even associate with doing sales. So this is a foreign concept to them, which is why we love working with them. 
Um, and they're doing big deals, Jenny. So our clients at the bottom end are doing deals worth tens of thousands, but really they're doing deals with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, because then it means their buying cycle is long and it has complexity in it. Yep. And so we, with our repeatable process, shorten that and take the complexity out of it. Okay. And when you were going through that sort of, you know, the the um, the list of, of those industries that you um, tr- usually work with, the thing that came into my mind was these are the guys, as in a generic term, male or female, who can also have that story of um, I'm not good at selling. Yeah, and that would be I don't want to do selling, yeah. Yeah, this would be common for most of our clients, Jenny. So in the engineering example, and we love working with engineers, uh, they're smart, they're methodical. Um, This information is all greenfields for them. Um, And again, the reason why we don't work with traditional sales teams is because sarcastically, I can say this because I've come from that industry, they've heard it all, Jenny, and you can't teach them anything. So so it's much more satisfying work and enjoyable. And you know what? Everyone wants to work with more enjoyable clients. So, So our clients are, in this example, they are doing the client delivery, but as well as they are tasked with converting new opportunities and optimizing existing accounts. So we've always worked on the, like, you know, we had uh, clients for 20 years and it was always yeah. about relationship building. So does that yeah. factor into what you're doing as well around, you know, main, building and, and maintaining those relationships during that sales Yeah, this is process? really, really important. And for our clients, because they're all playing long game, which means no one meets with them the first time and then converts, they all need to play the long game to some degree. And that could be three, three months, like Jenny, that could mean three years. Mm. Some of these partnerships that our clients are doing take long game and they are absolutely based on relationship. And that's because people buy from people they like yep. and people are more inclined to agree with people they like. Okay. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? You know, um, you know I'm, I'm typical Aussie have, you know, the, the story about sales. And, and I find, you know, living here in Bali that we were in a shop uh, in the last couple of days and um, the woman just followed us around the store you know do you want this do you want that do you want something else do you want and we walked out because um i think as australians we just don't like being um pushed um and and people being salesy so so and let let's focus on that word salesy um we we're so different i think in australia to um you know particularly the us um certainly here in asia it's it's a very very different culture around sales mm-hmm. and a different um i guess approach or, or um mindset around sales so how do you manage that around a somebody who says i don't want to do sales which is definitely what our team um you know they'd run for the hills if we said you know you have to sell stuff um we had determined that um we're not selling we're solving people's problems um because they could do that but how do you manage that if you're working with a client and you go in to do that um, a facilitation process and you've got the deer in the headlights oh my god this person's going to tell me i have to sell and i don't want to do that yeah, the, the biggest shift, and, you know, people ask me all the time, how much of what I do is mindset? My answer is 1% or less. But what I find is when people have the skills and techniques, they can actually run with it very successfully. Our point of difference, Jenny, with this repeatable process that I will share more about shortly, but we teach the sales of, uh, we, we teach the skills of sales and negotiation in a repeatable, customizable sales process. We teach these skills to, so that, that they can be done with humility it's a trust first approach and it's centered on human connection. Yep. Now, the irony there is tr- uh, uh, sales and humility aren't generally words you hear in the same sentence. Same sentence no. So the fact that we can do this does allow us to stand out because what this means is when we, when we do this right, in terms of when we have these sales conversations the right way, they should feel humble. They should feel that we're serving someone else more than ourselves. And it's a trust first approach where we make our conversation in sales less about us and more about helping someone else. And that changes everything. And again, that's the reason why we work with non-traditional sales businesses. I love that. It's not the, uh, you know, the, the fear and doom approach. So, so share with us your process. Take us through what that yeah. looks like. Yeah. So our, our program is called, um, Jenny, it's called the Infinite Sales System. And this is a a system based on world's best practice because I've worked with some of the biggest companies in the world when I was working corporate and leading large sales teams. Uh, But the cool, interesting part is it's also based on advanced negotiation skills. 
Uh, I have learned and I continue to learn negotiation skills from hostage crisis and terrorist negotiators. Uh, and it is as interesting as what people think it would be. <laughs> so the stories are fascinating. What's really interesting, though, is that the same skills and techniques that the FBI negotiators are using when they're talking to hostage takers and terrorists are the same skills and techniques we can use in business, in corporate conversations, to convert more qualified opportunities, increase our margins, and win more negotiations. So this infinite sales system is based on those two things, that, that world's best practice and those advanced negotiation skills. And There's no three principles required. it's based on. Sorry, Jenny, sorry, what was I said, that? And no hostages required. No, no violence, no <laughs> hostages. I hear that a lot. <laughs> but there's three principles that underpin the infinite sales system, and they are qualify, convert, and follow up. Qualify is to help our clients get in front of more of the right kinds of opportunities, not more opportunities, more of the right ones. Mm -hmm. Converting is what to say and what to do so that you can have competitive advantage so that you can start to win the business from the first conversation. Um, it's how to have the margin or the price conversation and win at full margin without discounting. Um, and the third principle it's based on is follow-up. We notice a lot that especially in professional services, you may come across it yourself, uh, Jenny, that when um, the research tells us that 90% of uh, new business opportunities are converted at the point after you've sent someone your proposal. And what tends to happen is when we're talking with professionals, they tend to send a proposal and do some of this. And this is yep. a very risky strategy. Uh, <laughs> uh, hope does not make us any money. It's nice to have, but it doesn't make us any money. Mm -hmm. And so there is a whole methodology around follow-up where you can do that in a really genuine way that's value-adding, that again, really builds on that trust and that, you know, someone doesn't become annoying. So those are the three principles that we we teach, and it's an end-to-end, -end, repeatable system customised to every client that we work with. And it's interesting that step three, and I think, um, and certainly I've been guilty of this in the past, of, of failing to follow up. Um, and I'll, I'm sure it's a bit of, you know, fear of rejection and, and those sort of things that, um, you know, you do all of that work and then you just never go back and actually ask for the deal. And, um, and you know, whatever, for whatever reason, uh, but like I said, certainly you've been guilty of that uh, myself. It's, now, what, it's not uncommon. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I definitely don't think I'm special in that regard. So tell me what, um, I was just writing a couple of notes as you were talking, AI, and, and I know, um, you know we do, um, um, I see some of the posts that you put up on LinkedIn and around, you know, how AI is changing, um, you know, some of the, um, or a lot in what we do every day. But where do you see, and uh, specifically around LinkedIn, where do you see AI taking us from a, you know, generating of leads, getting, you know, to the right sort of people? How are we going to be using that, do you think, at this point in time with, you know, changing every hour as it is? Yeah. So my my hot tip um, on this question, which I get asked a lot, Jenny, is proceed with caution. So AI is a fabulous productivity tool with lots of different uh, plugins and, and, and platforms around that can help us. Uh, I did a hilarious post just the other day about last, uh, in this year, my head of marketing said we had to do professional headshots and get that done. And I thought, I don't have time to spend half a day getting headshots done. And I couldn't think of anything worse, Jenny, than standing there and posing while someone takes my photo. So I said to him, surely there's a way I can shortcut this process, surely. So I went and paid 26 bucks. Um, I posted some results on LinkedIn. Uh, needless to say, I then went and got a professional photographer. <laughs> so, so, so yes, it can be a bit of fun. Uh, yes, it can also, you know, I'm sure, but you know, that's AI is changing all the time. So even from six months ago when I did that, I'm sure it's even better today. Um, but there definitely are productivity gains. When you link it back to the sales experience, what it will never do, what AI I genuinely believe will never do is replace the hearts and the handshakes. Yep. Now, the hearts and the handshakes in this kind of world, the hearts is that emotional connection we have to somebody and people buy from people they like. And the, the handshakes is that trust. So yep. if we're not trusting with somebody and especially to our clients who are doing big deals, I don't know, do you want to, do, do you want to hand over six or seven or eight figures to, to a company you've never interacted with another human before? I certainly wouldn't. I think, I think that would be high risk. We all want to know who is the person behind the delivery 
or who was the person behind the company or who's the team doing delivery. So whilst AI does have some opportunity for productivity gains, and as you shared, you know, it can be great for lead generation. Um, it can even be great um, use for proposal building, but it will not replace the opportunity um, uh, it will not replace humans that are required to interact in a sales process to convert opportunities. Yep. Yeah, completely agree. It's um, um we had a, a session actually here in Bali a few a few months back with uh, EO, and uh, one of the things that I loved is the comment around um, you know, AI will you know have more and more of the answers, but we need to be asking great questions. So mm. now. One of my pet hates, and I get this, I'm pretty sure every day, is just these random people sending me a LinkedIn connection request. Never heard of them, don't know who they are, don't know what they do. There might be some um, commonality of, uh, you know, of connections, other, you know, other people. Does it actually work? Because I just look at it and say, well, you can't even bother to send a message. Not that that actually has much more effect usually because I can tell it's just a randomly generated thing. But does it actually work? Do people you know, can, um, accept those connection requests? Yeah, so this is really interesting. I get asked about this a lot. Um, and... Um... You know, LinkedIn, as I said, is a, is, a, is, a, is a marketplace of a billion users. So, you know, it's the rules are slightly different, right? So you imagine we went to a networking event, Jenny, where you and I are in the room with 50 other people who we like and, you know, maybe we come together through through EO when there's people in the room that we, we like and we already trust. Uh, the rules are different. I would not go up to you at a networking event, hand you my business card, not say a word and walk away. Mm. Who does it, right? So in real yeah. life, it's weird. So, yes, but people, the, the rules are different on LinkedIn. I'm not saying that they're right, but they're different. And people are looking for needles and haystacks. Yeah. Um, so when, when, you know, people approach me with the same sort of, um, you know, um, invitation, Jenny, whether there's a message in there, mostly there's not. Um, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a true salesperson. So I want to find out and, and I want to strike up a chat. So I just have an automatic message that I send back to everyone who invites me to connect a copy and paste it's really quick and easy and it's along the lines of hey jenny thanks for um your invitation to connect happy to um uh can i ask uh, was there something in mind that you had for connecting with me hope you're having a great day so i'm i'm also looking for needles and haystacks and that message has i can guarantee you i can sorry i can tell you i can tell you that's made me hundreds of thousands of dollars because some people just connect some people forget to hit the message button um and some people don't know what to say and I'm just inviting them to step in for for some chit chat, and that that alone has absolutely landed us in some great clients with some great clients. Maybe I'll change my approach to uh, from no uh, to uh, yeah, sending a message <laughs> like that. <laughs> but it's a numbers game too, right? So um, and it depends. You know, I you know I'm open for business. Um, I do like the exchange. I have uh, I absolutely have met some what I would call lifelong friends through LinkedIn. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly up to see where a connection could lead. Nice. Cool. And I reckon, you know, if I was just to take a guess, I'm going to say probably 30% of people reply back to that message. Okay. 70% don't reply. So that's fine. But 30% are happy to step in for some chit chat. Great. Nice. And yeah, uh, you can see. I, I guess um, I, I I can usually spot the ones that are the the probably AI oh, yes. generated oh, and yeah. that sort of thing. Exactly. Just rolling out the you know anybody who with a pulse you know send them a connection. Exactly. So, so. now who are your clients? So um, what sort of you talked before about um, you know the industries that you work for? Oh, sorry, work with. What size of business are they? Are they, you know, you're talking, you know, sort of big, um, you know, um, enterprise, corporates. Do you work with smaller businesses? We tend to work with, um, we steer away. We, I mean, we've got, we've always, there's always got, we've got some bigger and some smaller, but we tend to steer away from t uh, top tier. So we work probably second tier, third tier, fourth tier. Um, in terms of turnover, our clients are probably at the bottom end turning over about 30 mil up to about probably 500 mil. Okay. And the reason why we play in that space is what I have found is that those businesses are generally still run by the people who own them. Yep. So it feels different 
than working big end corporate, which is where I've come from professionally. That was my big, my, that was my, you know, two decades of corporate experience working big end corporate. Yep. So um, working second, third, fourth tier, and as I said, I've got some top tier and I've got some low, um, uh, smaller ones as well. The process is still the same. They all have the same troubles um, and challenges, but we tend to stay in that second, third, fourth tier. Yeah, nice. Okay, your book. Tell me about your book. You said you've uh, you've just signed a deal. Yeah, so that's cool, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> it's, there's a funny story behind it because when the approach came in um, to begin with, uh, it sounded, it reeked a bit of like Nigerian prince uh, <laughs> promising me worlds of greatness and, and you know, treasures to behold. <laughs> so I, I replied back to the, um, the contact and my words were, uh, while this whilst this sounds great, it does sound a bit, I did say, scammy, scam, scam. Uh, here is my email address. Could you please find some way to show me that this is legitimate? And I was 50-50. I didn't sleep for a couple of nights because I was thinking, oh, my God, imagine if it's true. Wouldn't this be great? Um, but also I was thinking it did sound very, scam, very scammy. Uh, but, no, it was legitimate. <laughs> so um, so I was in, I've been in contact um, with the publisher for a, a couple of months um, we had some forward and back on a few meetings on different things. I signed the contract on Friday, just gone, so only a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because I asked them um, in one of the meetings recently, Jenny, I said, um, I'm curious, there are loads of sales books around. And this is, um, this is a major publisher. This is the major publisher of business books. Okay. And, um, and I said, there are loads of sales books around. Like, why this one? And I, and I was curious. It wasn't really an imposter syndrome thing. I, I was curious. Like, there are so many around already. And they said to me, there are so many around already, but they are not based on an end-to-end -end system that's done with the principles of humility, a trust-first approach, approach and people connection. So, um, and it was funny because for years I have been saying to my clients, our system is unique. But hearing that played back to me, I was like, Oh, wow, maybe a system really is unique. <laughs> so it was it was almost like an out of body experience going, Oh, maybe I am on a good thing here. <laughs> so that was quite funny. Nice. Um, the second funny thing that came out of it is when we were in conversations at um in the last month, they said, Look, if this proceeds to contract stage, um, your first your your final manuscript is due on uh January the eighth. And I started laughing. And they said, What's so funny? I said, Oh, I thought you actually just said January the eighth. And she said, I did. I said, yeah, but not this one, right? Not this one coming like in a few weeks from now. She said, yeah, that one. <laughs> so, Holy so cow. That's the so one. you've got to do it in a few weeks. Yeah, I'm about 80% done though, maybe oh, even good. 90%. Like I'm, okay. I'm ripping through it. Um, but, you know, like, you know, give a busy, give, give, what is it? Give a busy person a job type thing. Like it's, yep. it's that. Yep. Um, and if, and if so I'm sure if they eight. gave you till the January 8th, 2025, you'd still be starting it this time next year. Yeah, probably, right? <laughs> so um, so that's been an interesting experience. Um, and so I did have a panic in the beginning. And I said to my assistant, anything that's in my calendar that's not urgent now, can you just move that to next year and replace that with, replace that with writing time? So, um, so that's been helpful. <laughs> Okay, let's wrap. Congratulations on that. It's awesome. Looking forward to seeing that when it comes out. Um, so, what's the lead Thank time? You. When you've you've um, managed uh, the final draft in eighth uh, of January, which is only a few weeks away. What's the lead time from there? What's the publishing time? Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm learning a lot. Um, it's a January um, manuscript due for a July release. Okay. Otherwise, it would have been a July manuscript for a December release. Now, a book uh, okay. on revenue. Uh, launching that in Australia in December would be the worst time of the year. Oh, yeah. So as yeah. a result, it's now the best time of the year because it's the new financial year mm. uh, and a great time to talk about uh, reviewing revenue and re revenue strategies for the year ahead. So yeah, that's um, when we're looking at uh, those things, which again yeah. is why I don't want to miss that deadline. <laughs> yep. Nice. Okay, let's wrap up with three tips. So uh, we always start with the professional and personal win and we always end with the three tips. So what are the three things you'd like to share with anybody who's listening? Yeah, I, I think the first um, part is, especially when you're running your own business, Jenny, it's really important to have people around you who see what you don't see and who can hold the mirror up. So I have mentors around me, um, formally engaged and informal uh, mentors. 
And um, I think that's really important because they are prepared to challenge me on my thinking. When you work corporate or when you're an employee, welcome or not, you get feedback. And when you work for yourself, you don't get that as much. And it's hard to see and um, it's hard to see how you're going. So get get a get a bunch of people around you, have more than one, and have people who are prepared to tell you the truth. That would be one tip. Mm-hmm. Uh, another business tip would be get a sales process in your business. Most businesses are doing uh, sales by accident. Uh, don't be doing sales by accident. That doesn't help. Get a sales process. If it's not mine, get someone else's, but get a sales process. Mm-hmm. Um, and the third probably tip I would give is, uh, and this is, you know, this probably came to me two years ago. I've got a young family and getting a business going and getting that traction can be tricky. I didn't have hobbies for a long time, especially when the kids were young. So I've now got hobbies again. And that is important. I love what I do. I I love what I do so much. I would work for free. I like that I don't work for free, but I would work for free. (laughs) And I find, I feel like my job is my hobby, but it's also not healthy to do the same thing all the time. So it is important to have time to do a hobby that's not connected to what you do. Love it. Yeah, and I think that's something as entrepreneurs we often struggle with. Um, Somebody asked me a couple of years ago who, uh, when we implemented EOS into our business, um, he, that person then stepped into my role of general manager, which I'd been trying to get out of for years. And he said to me one day, you know, you need to find a hobby. So this is an employee Mm. telling the owner of the business. And and I kind of laughed at him. I said, what what should I do? Take up knitting? And he said, it actually doesn't matter what it is, but you need to go and find a hobby. You need to find something outside of the business because I didn't have anything um, and yeah. I still don't know that if you, know, if, if you said to me what's your hobby I actually probably still don't have an answer for that but it's um, just an activity no, right that. like it's just something that you don't and you know the ones that I do uh, and they're random can I share what they are absolutely uh, so I do adult gymnastics on a Monday night it's a class for has-beens and wannabes I was curious to see if I could still <laughs> flip um, I'm a bit of both. I am can a has-been and a wannabe um, at 45 years old. I can still flip. There is a core video on LinkedIn. I put it up so you can see me flipping. Um, so uh, so that's my Monday night activity. And I started drumming, drum lessons a year ago, also fun and random. But while I'm doing those activities, not at the same time, uh, I'm not thinking about work. And I love my family, but I'm not thinking about my family then either. I'm just... I'm just doing something that is for me and that feels really good, but it also feels necessary. Nice. Actually, one of my clients, um, their ops manager, uh, she just worked um, and she's sort of, she's nearing retiring age and she just worked all the time, way too much. And about 18 months ago, she took up, or maybe less than that, maybe it's a year ago, she took up the guitar. Never played yeah. it before, and um, and I um, we ran a session in Australia uh, last month, November, and she said, "My husband can now tell the song that I'm playing." Oh, see, but, that's so good. Yeah, and she's just so excited about it. And she she said she plays for half an hour before she starts work. She plays in her lunchtime, and then she actually finishes work to play a guitar before she makes dinner or has dinner. And that's she nice. said it's just completely transformed her from all she did was work to now she just takes those breaks. Yeah. And she said she's far more productive and far happier and a far better leader. Yeah because she's got this thing that she's doing and the bonus is her husband actually can now recognise songs. Yeah, that is great. I love that story. <laughs> so, okay, let's wrap it up. Thank you so much time for your time, Julia. Really appreciate it. Uh, we will share your details um, on the links with all of the podcast. Uh, really looking forward to uh, seeing the book. So please stay in, we'll stay in contact and uh, we'll share that as well when it comes out. Um, but thanks for sharing your expertise and your story. Really enjoyed listening to you. Thanks, Jenny. I really um, appreciate being invited to come and chat with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. 
I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my entrepreneur's playground and event center in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.